This past week, we had two special meetings for the whole congregation to be free to attend, of which a good number of you did. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say the most encouraging thing about these meetings is the spirit of the group that attended. For as challenging as what lies before us may be, will be, we have shown a, a patient care and concern and wisdom. And more than anything, the confession that has been given is that our church, our congregation, is not a building, but is indeed the people who gather to hear God's word and to receive his supper together. And that is what we as Lutherans officially believe. It's what we teach. It's what the Bible says. But I would not be telling you the truth if I said that all Lutherans actually believe that. It's been my experience in more than one occasion that the building in which a congregation worships is the most important thing to them. It is their identity more than anything else. My first call in New Jersey was to help a congregation of about 30 people try to turn their little ship around in about three years. In theory, we had three years of funding. It didn't actually turn out that we had it, but we thought we did. But in order to turn the ship around, they needed to leave their building. Now, their building was about 15 minutes outside of the very small town in the middle of nowhere. So, like literally down a dirt road. And the only location for 30 miles in any direction, 25 miles in any direction, was this other little town. Needless to say, the moment the conversation began, perhaps we should try to go where the people are, the entire thing flared up into a tremendous hate-filled fight. And I will remember probably to my dying day the words of, of one lady. She was a cantankerous sort, generally. Uh, I don't know that she meant to be so. You, you maybe never been to New Jersey. They're all a little bit more cantankerous. Uh, but I remember her words, and her words broke my heart. She said, we built this church with our blood. And as a pastor, I couldn't help but hear the theological import of those words. The only church that is a church is the one that's built with Jesus' blood, not ours. And of course, she didn't mean the church of God on earth. She meant the building, but that's just it. She had really confused the two. Buildings are great. We need them. We need one, right? A place to go and gather. But when they distract us from the real thing, they become an idol, a danger to us. And again, this is why I have been so pleased with the way the conversation has gone so far. There will be one more meeting. Well, maybe more. There will be at least one more just discussion meeting two weeks from this Sunday in that room back there during the Bible study hour. And if you've not come to any yet, I would encourage you to try to come to that. We're going to do a little bit less of presentation and try to have a little bit more of conversation. The goal would be, for those of you especially who have heard the information now, to actually have a chance to say, I think we should do this. I speak in favor of this direction or that direction. And the goal is to start that conversation in a place that's not a voters meeting because there aren't as many rules. In the voters meeting, you have to keep things in a certain order and say things in a certain way. And that's why it gets so heated so fast is because everyone's a little uh, confused by the order itself. So the goal is just to get together and talk so that by the time we come to the voters meeting, hopefully we know what we're going to do. And if it takes another meeting after this between them, then that's what we're gonna do. All of that being said, I couldn't help but then be driven to believe that the words spoken through Isaiah the prophet are precisely the words we're ready to hear today. I also want to touch on Romans 6, so we'll get there by the end of this thing. I have to leave behind, unfortunately, Jesus' baptism at the Jordan today. 
I, 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 we'll get there next year. <laughs> but for today, if you would pull out Isaiah chapter 43 and hear these words. Remember that everything today in the liturgy is about baptism. It is about Jesus' baptism, which is the model, and then the work which creates and makes your baptism. So this text was picked with baptism in mind, even though baptism did not exist in the days of Isaiah. But these words are very much at the heart of what baptism does, what baptism is. So first, he says, now thus says the Lord. And you got to stop right there and recognize what a rare thing in history it is for a prophet to be given a word to speak. It wasn't like in Old Testament times, there were prophecies flinging about and miracles happening left and right. We think that because when we read the Bible, it skips from miracle to miracle and leaves behind all the other stuff. But for us, a man to stand up and say, thus says the Lord, a new word from God for you. This is a pretty potent thing. It means, if it's true, that God himself is indeed speaking something for the whole world to know. Today, in many, say, Pentecostal or evangelical churches, there are those who believe that God speaks to them, that God gives messages and helps them kind of figure out where to go. In fact, often they use prayer as sort of their resource for this, as if by praying to God, I got this, like, this mental connection that I'll kind of know what the right thing is. All devoid of the scriptures, mind you. The challenge with that is, specifically... They believe they are receiving revelations just for them. And that's not prophecy at all. Prophecy is a revelation for all, for public. Right? So there is no word that comes to somebody, a burden in their bosom, just for them that isn't meant to be true for you too. And that is one way to test true pro prophecy versus false prophecy. If it's just a special thing for them, it's just in their head. Or perhaps worse, a demon. The prophets say, thus says the Lord to you publicly. And I want to immediately make the connection that that is also what baptism is. Baptism is, thus says the Lord to you. You want a private revelation, that's actually it. It's a place where you are pulled out of the masses of the world and set individually before God, and God says, in my name. And he hits you with it. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. This is both talking about the creation of the world, that all mankind has been made by God in the first place, but also the establishment of Israel as the Old Testament church, as a people who know who God is and who believe his words. So God who made them and God who has called them out of darkness into light, he is now going to speak. So again, when it says Jacob, when it says Israel, you need to hear that as the church before Jesus came. So then how does this apply to us? We're the church after Jesus came. Well, fear not. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Christianity, he who formed you, O congregation of St. Paul. That's perfectly fine to have that in there. Or whatever other congregation is a true Christian congregation could say the exact same thing. I have a word for you because I made you and I'm buying you. And that's actually what he says next. Fear not, for I have bought you. Redemption. We've talked about this before. A fair exchange. One thing given for another. Very much what Jesus is doing in the Jordan River. He is exchanging himself for sinners. He's standing in their place, beginning the work of redemption. But don't miss then how much of this is a purchase. It is a buying you are not your own. You are a slave now. A slave of the king bought with a blood price. But the result of this, don't go too, past, too fast past the fear not. The first thing he says before it is, I bought you, is there is nothing to fear anymore. You have nothing to fear anymore. Now, does that mean you'll never fear? Of course not. You're a human. You're a sinner. You're going to fear all the time. But it remains true that there is nothing to fear. All the fears that you have are in your own head. 
All the scary things about danger and uh, destruction and life and, oh, it might not go the way I want or, oh, I might die. All of that in your head. You are immortal because of the baptism you have in Christ. There is nothing to fear. You are bought. I have called you by name, he says. You are mine. Now that name again for them is Israel. And for us is the name of Christ, Christianity. But don't miss the echo, the shadow, that at baptism you are called by name. Whatever your name is, it is spoken over you with your baptism. That's on purpose. You, identified by this sound, are the one who is washed by this word from the Lord. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, he says. And this is getting into a little bit of, of why I think this is so important for us as St. Paul today. But historically, they think of, or we think of these waters again as an echo, a type, a shadow of baptism. That when you pass through the waters of baptism, God is there with you. That's not really what Isaiah had in mind, but it is true about baptism. What Isaiah had in mind is that the nation of Israel, when they went through trial and tribulation and struggle, when their enemies attacked, when there was famine, when the, whatever the world would throw at them, whenever they would have trial, God was with them. He was with them to sustain them and to hold them. And I can't help but be a little reminded of something that's common in a lot of mythology. I don't know how much you remember of particularly Greek mythology from your, your childhood, but you might have heard the, the name the river Styx before. In, in Greek mythology, the river Styx is the, the last place you go before you enter into the world of death. And to cross that river is to enter into, really, a shadow land. Even those who were good and ended up with the best that they could get on the other side of death, it wasn't as good as real life. And so you would, you would pass through these waters into, uh, into a worse place. Now, that's the river in Greek mythology. There is a river in Christian history as well. There's actually two, if you count the Red Sea, where Israel passes through the waters of the Red Sea on their way not to a shadow land, but on their way to a promised land. And again, when they cross the Jordan River on dry ground, entering into the promised land where milk and honey and all their needs would be met according to promise. That's very much more what's going on here, but then applying that to... The actual fact of all humans in the world, in our sinful condition, undergoing that river sticks death, that danger, that flood, and having the promise that in the waters of baptism in the body of Christ, God is with us so that nothing can stop us. That means for you, congregation of St. Paul, whatever decisions get made and whatever struggles happen over the next year, whatever waters you must cross, God is with you to sustain you, not for your own precious treasured joys but to bring you to everlasting life with each other to keep you reminded of your immortality because of the death of Christ that is the promise that you have and you carry when you pass through the waters I will be with you and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you when you walk through fire you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you hell has no hold on you anymore. How much less the things of this age and this life. Because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Then he says something a little odd for us, right? I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Cush is actually Egypt. And Seba, if I'm not mistaken, is south of Egypt. So he's talking about a region of the world. He then goes on and also says it more, I give men in return for you. This is in the middle of, of verse 4. Peoples in exchange for your life. Well, the people of Egypt were not crucified for the salvation of the world. So that's not quite what it's talking about. But it is by typology, by shadow. So put yourself in the nation of Israel's mind underneath Isaiah's time. And God is proclaiming to them that rather than be destroyed by their enemies and the trials that they see coming, he is with them, he's holding them by name, and he will protect them, and he's going to do it by bringing Egypt up in some way, having Egypt be the one that takes the brunt of whatever force they were being threatened by. 
So he exchanges one nation for another as the Almighty God, and the nation he protects is the one that has his promises. But that is merely a shadow, a type of what he really intends to do for the world. He doesn't plan to have some nations die and some nations live. He plans to have one man die so that all men may live. And so he doesn't give Egypt in exchange for you, but Jesus in exchange for you. Again, what Jesus does at his baptism in the Jordan River is he says, I am here to be exchanged. That's what I'm willing to do. I will take these waters which destroy, and I will turn them into waters which give life. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Fear not, verse 5, for I am with you. And then it goes into a, a mission statement, right? A mission phrase about what this will do. That it will not leave the people without children. And those children are a picture not only of actual offspring, that too, but of other nations, other peoples, hearing this word and coming to believe. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. What that means is like, give them up. Mine that are in the north, your no you north can no longer hold them. You must give them back to me, right? And to the south, you cannot withhold them. They must be allowed to come to me. Now for the nation of Israel, dealing with the exile and the loss of the ten tribes and the scattering of their brothers and sisters to the world, this is a promise that somehow, some way, God's going to bring them all back together. That never quite happens. He never brings those lost ten tribes back. But what he does do is in the body of Jesus Christ reconciles all tribes, all nations to himself, and then sends us out into the world to declare to all nations that a baptism into Christ is life everlasting. So I cannot but hear this as a very hopeful text for us. For us as a congregation, I've already shared that when we walk through whatever decision we walk through, because we are walking in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit, because we are walking underneath the Word of God, His Christ, and His grace, He is going to be with us through those decisions to bring us safely to the other side, and not just us, but those who aren't even here yet. I do not for one minute believe that we have found ourselves at this precipice in Rockford in order to get for ourselves a nice little comfortable church that we can have as our private club. I believe we have been left at this place in this time so that coming out of the next couple of years of rethinking who we are and reorienting who we are toward who we ought to be, that we will become a place that will, that will not sit back and allow the rest of Rockford to not know about Christ. And to not know about how we preach Christ differently here. And to know about baptism and what it really is. And know about this meal and what it really is. There are many churches in Rockford and they do not have this meal. They have some bread and wine that they do not believe does anything. And in this, while they are indeed Christians, they are Christians being, uh, having their hope stolen from them. The false shepherds are not giving them life. Can they live? Can they be saved? Yes, of course they can. Where the word of God remains, some of them will still believe. But we, by no means, should sit back and allow falsehood to dominate. And as much as there are many other Christians that need to hear this, there are many non-Christians in this city, and they need to hear it too. I believe that God will say to the East, give them up. And to the west, bring them out. And to the south, show them what I preach. And to the north, come and hear, come and see. Because that's what he does. It's what he always does. Everyone who is called by my name. Again, hear the baptism in that. Called by the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, at this point in the sermon at the other church, I said, with three minutes left, I'm going to finish it up. And I went six minutes, so I'm going to try it this time. With six minutes left, we're going to dance over to Romans chapter 6. Because I can't not say what baptism is according to Paul's words for you. This is the most glorious, beautiful text. It is, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it is so amazing. So succinctly summarizes our hope. I'm going to start at verse 3 for the sake of the time, even though the issue in verse 1 is important. But verse 3 
You should memorize this verse. Plaque, I mean, you know, if you're into tattoos, tattoo this verse. Forget that I can do all things for, through Christ who strengthens me. Put this verse on your arm, young men. I just said that. You can ask me about it later, but I did just say that. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul asks the question as if he is surprised that the Romans might not know this. But the more I think about it, the more I think we don't know it either. If I were to ask you, what does baptism give you? I think maybe if you're well trained, you might say the Holy Spirit, right? Or you might say the forgiveness of sins. Those are both true answers. They're good answers. But they're not the only answer. And Paul here says, here says well, don't you know? That baptism gives you death? That when you bring a baby to that font, or an adult, and you put that water over the top of them, they are being murdered by God. Don't you know that? I'm not sure we do. Is that what we go out and tell people? Would you like to come to my church and get killed? <laughs> yeah? But that is exactly what Paul says happens. We were buried with Christ by baptism into death. That's verse 4. Now, there's a reason that God murders us with the death of Christ. And I, should, I didn't say this clearly enough. The murder that takes place there is not that you actually fall down dead. None of us have had that happen. But that transcosmically, in God's sight, he's actually taking you, body and soul, back into the body of Jesus on the cross and shoving you in at his dying breath so that when he dies, he has you inside of him. You die with his death. And there's a reason for that. It's the rest of the verse. We were buried, verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he kills you in Christ so that just as Christ died and didn't stay dead because death has no dominion over him, so neither does death have dominion over you. Just as Christ has died and raised, so you also are already raised from the dead in Christ. Now, this is where faith alone becomes very important. It's by faith alone that you actually experience this. You don't feel raised from the dead, do you? I don't. Never do. But I am. I'll say it again. You are an immortal now. Death cannot contain you. And the language of walking in newness in life is not only about that resurrection which is going to come physically to you, but the awareness of it now. That every step and every decision and every move and every day now is lived as one who knows that death cannot contain you. That is a dramatic change. That is a phenomenal change. The entire world is trying to keep death away. And you can walk every day willing to risk now, I don't mean be stupid, don't go jump off a bridge, but you can walk every day willing to risk the good, to seek the good of others, because you know that nothing can touch you. When you pass through the waters, he is with you. Verse 5, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Death and resurrection go together. You don't get one without the other in Christ. Verse 6, we know that our old self, the language is old man, old Adam, our sinful condition. We know that our old self was crucified with him. In order that, with a reason, with a result, that the body of sin might be brought to nothing and we'd no longer be enslaved to sin. That means that because I know my original sin and all sins that come from me are in him, not only do I have the power to stand here and say, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm also forgiven and death cannot contain me, but then the next time my hand wants to sin, I can try to stop it. And I can try to stop it not because I think I'm going to get something, but because I know it's wrong. I know it's not for somebody else's good, and I have a reason to fight again, a reason to stand. We have died to sin. We're no longer enslaved to it. 4 verse 7, the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we will believe we will also live with him. Repetition, same idea. Verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Again, same idea. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. 
Right? So, so sin kills him, and he holds sin as he dies. But it is for all people in one time. And now, the life he lives, he lives to God. So his resurrection is without sin and before God. That is the setup for verse 11. So now you also must consider yourselves dead to sin. I have died with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My sin is there and gone. Even the ones I still see, even the ones I know I have yet to commit and will not be able to stop committing, thought, word, and deed, it's all in Christ. I must count myself dead in that way. And this is great news. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ because as dead as I am in me, I have the grace over me to compel me to stand. And even after I've failed to slap my hand, to look at my hand and say, it's not going to hell and next time I'm going to fight harder because I stand beneath the grace of Christ. Now how much more, friends, does this not apply to our life as a congregation? There will be many opinions about how we got to this place, how we ended up letting such a large, functioning, healthy, driven congregation get to the place where we have to let go of something and figure out how to reorient. You can, you can live in that. You can point fingers if you want. Or, better, be free to acknowledge the failure for what it is under the grace of the cross to own the failure when it's yours and say, that was mine, that was bad, that was wrong, that was foolish. But to keep walking forward, not needing to justify yourself, but instead knowing you are an immortal. And there's a bunch of other people out there that you have the power to give that immortality to. And that we are going to reorient ourselves to make that our priority as a congregation. Hmm. In the name of Jesus. Amen.